Hi there, my name is Matthew Galuzzo. I'm a criminal defense attorney in Manhattan. I have been for about 14 years, and prior to that, I was an assistant district attorney in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Uh, yes, that's the same office as currently prosecuting Donald Trump for a 34 different felony counts in an indictment. And I've been getting asked a lot lately about uh, this case, about my thoughts on it, about just procedural aspects, about some strategic aspects. And so I figured that uh, the best way to sort of answer everybody's questions is to put it out there in a recording. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened today. Today was Donald Trump's arrest and arraignment down at Manhattan Criminal Court. That's 100 Center Street in Manhattan. And we knew this day was coming as of last week because last week we had word that the grand jury that had been investigating him, uh, supposedly about hush money payments to Stormy Daniels, had voted to indict him. Now, normally when a grand jury indicts somebody, that means a, an arrest warrant is issued therefrom. And of course, uh, Mr. Trump was down in Florida and rather than uh, send people out to get him, as is often the case in white collar cases or in cases where a defendant knows he's being investigated, uh, arrangements were made with Mr. Trump to come up here to New York to surrender himself uh, and satisfy this warrant that was requiring his presence. So uh, all those arrangements were made for today. There was a ton of security outside of the 100 Center Street building today. I was out and about in front of the building and actually had to go into the building for a case. And I can tell you that there were protesters uh, from both sides all over the, the block. Uh, there were a ton of ca uh, camera crews, obviously a ton of television uh, reporters out there um, interviewing people about what was going on and reporting about what was going on. Uh, for the most part, I'd say that there were probably more anti-Trump protesters than there were pro-Trump uh, protesters, but there were a lot of uh, Make America Great hats on uh, heads uh, in the area. But uh, you got the sense that the crowd was predominantly um, against Mr. Trump uh, outside of the 100 Center Street courthouse. But in any case, um, as part of this process, Mr. Trump surrendered himself and he had to be arrested, which normally involves having your fingerprints taken. Uh, the district attorney's office actually has these kinds of facilities inside uh, their office. Uh, sometimes this will be, well, actually most of the time, this will be done at a police precinct. But in these types of cases, it's not unusual for the uh, defendant to come into the DA's office, get fingerprinted there uh, with detectives in the DA's office. Usually you would get your mug shot taken, you would have a photograph taken of your face. I'm not sure whether that happened today with Mr. Trump. Um, I mean, I'm sure if it was taken, if it gets leaked, it will find its way onto millions of t-shirts and posters uh, inevitably, but uh, perhaps it wasn't taken. Maybe they decided it wasn't necessary. And then normally someone would be taken in handcuffs from this uh, room where they're getting processed into the courtroom where the handcuffs would then be taken off for the uh, defendant to sit in uh, front of the judge for what's called his arraignment. Now, because Mr. Trump has a Secret Service detail, which of course has never happened before, a defendant with a Secret Service detail, but because he has a Secret Service detail, uh, I don't believe they put handcuffs on him. They just walked him down the hall from uh, that processing room into the uh, courtroom where Judge Mershon was, was presiding and there were prosecutors there and Trump's attorneys were all there. And at that time, the accusation document called the indictment uh, was unsealed. Uh, as of prior to this arraignment, we knew there was an indictment and there had been leaked that there were 34 counts, but we didn't know what they were about. We hadn't seen the document itself. And that's because of the law. The law requires that once a grand jury votes an indictment, it is supposed to be sealed and private until such time as the defendant is brought forth to court for his arraignment. So this document was unsealed uh, once Mr. Trump appeared for his arraignment. And we learned a little bit more about these uh, documents, or about these accusations, I should say, I'm sorry. Mr. Trump, as is what always happens, uh, pleaded not guilty to the uh, indictment. Sometimes attorneys do that for their clients, but Mr. Trump apparently insisted on doing it himself just for the dramatic effect. And um, normally what would happen in a, following this is, uh, you know, the defendant receives the indictment. Uh, it can be read out loud in open court. Usually it's not. Usually you prefer just to read it for yourself. And then you tend to just discuss scheduling, like the next steps for the case. Um, in this particular case, I understand it. Uh, a few unusual things were discussed, one of which is a gag order. Uh, that happens sometimes in high-profile celebrity cases where people are talking to the press, either the prosecutor or the defense. Uh, apparently the judge declined to issue a gag order. He's going to let all of the parties continue to talk about the case, although he did admonish Mr. Trump they didn't want to see him say anything that might incite violence, and that's certainly understandable. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that Judge Mershon didn't go ahead and just put a gag order in place. 
Evidently, though, he doesn't want to interfere with the First Amendment rights of somebody who's campaigning for president. And uh, it's going to give him a chance to speak his mind on social media, on Truth Social, or wherever. Uh, and so, far, so long as he isn't um, inciting violence, of course, he has been making personal attacks against the judge. So I wouldn't be totally surprised if the judge changes his mind down the road and decides to put a gag order in effect on Mr. Trump and all the parties concerned. Um, the case was adjourned for nine months uh, until December, which is an unusually long adjournment, actually, in a felony case, even in a white-collar case. You would normally expect it to be about three or four months, maybe. Uh, in between now and those nine months, what I expect is going to happen is the prosecutors are going to have to turn over all of their evidence to the defense. And as that happens, I think we're going to start seeing some of it getting leaked to the press. We're going to start getting a better idea of what it is that the prosecution is relying upon to put this case on Mr. Trump. So things like grand jury testimony, reports, documents, you know, copies of all these checks and supposedly falsified business records are going to get turned over to the, pre to the defense. And the defense is going to make motions, which are written arguments about the evidence, about whether the presentation of the grand jury was legally sufficient, whether they really proved uh, that he was you know, guilty of those crimes. Uh, they're probably going to potentially argue for a transfer of venue out of Manhattan. We'll see about that. Uh, I think that could very well be in the mix uh, for this case. And, um, you know, I think they're going to go back and forth over the course of the next nine months, arguing about what other materials the prosecution is obligated to supply to the defense in terms of, you know, relevant documents, maybe about their witnesses or about uh, the business records of these businesses. So um, nine months is a long time. I'm surprised by that. I don't know exactly how that was determined, but apparently this case is complex and there's a lot of motions to be made and somehow they uh, convinced the judge to give them nine months. Uh, I say they because I assume this was the defense that asked for such a long adjournment because a long adjournment tends to favor the defense in every case. You know, witnesses get old, they, they, they get sick, they forget things, they say things, they contradict their prior testimony. And so the longer that a case lasts, it usually is advantageous for the defense. I mean, something can happen that, that's going to favor the defense. Um, you know, perhaps that's their strategy. Of course, here we also have the unusual element that you know, Donald Trump may be trying to get elected president before he goes to trial. It's hard to say exactly when this trial is going to happen. In December, you know, they might be scheduling a trial for the following year, or they might be talking about another adjournment for nine months or six months to resolve some motions that have been made uh, before they pick a trial date. So it's very conceivable, I'll tell you now, that maybe um, the trial is not going to happen before the election next year in November. Um, I'm sure that that is something that Donald Trump would love to see happen. Uh, that his trial gets postponed until after the election. I'm sure his attorneys are going to see what they can do, see if they can make that possible. Um, you know, I expect the prosecutor on the flip side is going to want it to happen before the election. So I, I don't know. This nine-month adjournment seems to kind of favor the defense a little bit, and that it's a very long adjournment, and I'm not sure what we're supposed to have accomplished by then. And so, you know, the closer they get to November 2024, I think the better for the defense and that they're able to uh, potentially you know, avoid ever actually even having to go to trial. What if he wins? What if he wins the presidency? And then, you know, this case hasn't been tried yet. I mean, is it, does it go forward or does it get dropped? I don't know. But I expect that uh, the defense would like to find out what would happen if uh, the case gets postponed after an election where maybe he's victorious. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is going to be an interesting case. I don't know who's going to win. Um, I'll tell you that one of the things that surprised me today was we learned from this indictment that it really is alleging a modus operandus in that it's not just about Stormy Daniels, that it's really alleging conduct related to two other people in kind of similar situations involving another woman and the uh, National Enquirer. And, you know, that just tends to suggest that uh, perhaps that Mr. Trump uh, was actively involved in all these things because it just keeps happening. It's not just one accidental issue where my, Mr. Cohen took care of things by himself. I mean, arguably, if you're the prosecutor, you're going to say that this shows that Mr. Trump knows what's going on, that he has this routine, this pattern, this approach to dealing with these types of issues, and that he is actively involved in all three of them, and that it wasn't just, you know, one-off uh, sort of misunderstanding between him and Mr. Cohen about what to do in this circumstance. When you have three incidents, it's obviously making the prosecution's case stronger. I don't know if it means they're going to win, but having three incidents is on the indictment was clearly intended to make their case stronger, clearly intended to, you know, anticipate a defense from Mr. Trump about him not being aware of what was going on or not being actively involved in it in terms of the business records. And so, um, you know, I think it's the case today got a little bit more difficult for Mr. Trump's defense team, I'll be honest. I'm not saying that they're going to lose again, but uh, that this revelation today in the indictment definitely favors the prosecution. And, you know, the other thing that you have to really consider and who's going to win or who's not 
is, you know, maybe what goes on in the courtroom today is not what really matters. I think what happened on the street, perhaps, was what is really matters. Because when you look out on the street, you know, you see a lot of Manhattan people protesting against Trump. And you see some people here protesting for Trump. Most of those folks are not from Manhattan. Most of those folks have traveled in here from either the other boroughs or from out of town, farther away, uh, to protest in favor of Mr. Trump. But, you know, if you look at the numbers here in Manhattan, he got 12% of the vote in Manhattan in the last presidential election, and he is uh, not popular, I guess you could say, in Manhattan. There are a lot of people who live in Manhattan who very much want to see him get convicted of a crime, no matter what the evidence. And those are going to be people on his jury pool. You know, you, the people who will be deciding this case are Manhattanites. They're not the people, you know, who came in from out of town to protest today. It's people who live here. And, you know, his trial attorneys are smart enough to know when they look across the jury pool, look across the landscape of Manhattan, that they're going to have a hard time finding 12 people who are going to be unanimous in a decision to acquit him. That is challenging given, you know, who he is, how well known he is, and what the public here in Manhattan thinks of him. He has a huge uphill battle in terms of picking a jury. You know, to, to, to win as a defense attorney, if you could get one juror out of 12 to refuse to convict, you get a hung jury and it's not a conviction and you live to fight another day and Donald Trump can go can proclaim that he is innocent and continue to campaign for president and 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 and, and tout that in any way he wants to. So they really just need one. But if they think they're going to walk with an acquittal, uh, given the jury pool that you know you see on the street today protesting and chanting Trump's name in a negative way, um, you know, look, that's going to be challenging to convince 12 Manhattan people not to convict him. That's that's my initial thought on this case. But you know, we will see. I'm very uh, interested in this case to see where it goes. I'm very excited about it. It's uh, as a professional in this area, you know, you like to see, um, you know, interesting cases uh, to analyze. And boy, this one is a is a doozy. So I'll uh, continue to provide updates and my thoughts on this case uh, as it uh, progresses. And I hope you continue to follow me. Thanks. Bye.